everyone. <laughs> I feel compelled to explain to you that the original program did not have me getting up four times in one day. <laughs> no, I, I feel bound to say that it did not. But, uh, oh, is that right? Okay. Okay, Elijah, God spoke. <laughs> really, it wasn't. So I wanted you to know that. I wanted you to know that. But at campus, we try to fill in and step into the breach whenever circumstances demand. And that's where the work of God goes. I'm delighted to see all of you who are here. Did I hear you say someone is here from Arise? Okay, I thought you said that because I say you missed that university. Okay. Well, then let's pray and get right into it. Five minutes to eight. Loving Father in heaven, you have been so gracious to us this day, since Wednesday when we arrived. Father, we thank you. If in the course of our being here we have offended you in thought, word, or deed, we apologize. And we ask you in your graciousness to forgive us. Now, Lord, remember the words spoken by David in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, where he said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Father, put your word in my tongue, I pray, and light into the minds of your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Those of you who have been here since Wednesday evening, have your eyes been opened? Amen. All right. You mean that from your heart? Amen. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because my message is connected with eyes opening, which is a sign of someone coming back to life. Go with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 9. And we shall begin reading at verse 20. Do we have Genesis 9, verse 20? And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and he was drunken, and he was what? Uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now, read the last verse for me, verse 24. And Noah, and Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Now, there has been a raging debate as to precisely what is meant by what his younger son had done unto him. For the purpose of this presentation, that is entirely irrelevant. What I want you to focus on is Noah awoke from his wine and knew while he was under the stupor of alcohol, he did not know what was being done to him. Are you with me? And so he awoke from his wine. Let's look at someone else similarly affected by wine. Genesis 19, reading from verse 30. This is an experience in the life of Brother Lot, the nephew of Abraham. Genesis 19, reading from verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in a mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the eldest, or the firstborn, said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Talk about horrible crimes. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. You finish that verse. He had no clue what was happening to him because he was under the influence of alcohol. 
And this has nothing to do with temperance, this presentation. Next verse. And it came to pass the next day that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Come, let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose, or went, arose, and lay with him. And finish it for me. Now read verse 36. Thus were what? Both the daughters of Lot with, by their, thus meaning in this manner. While he was out of his mind, while he had no control over his physical behavior, these two sons were born. Think of Noah, powerful man, man of God, who let out in the flood, uh, the preservation of eight people in the flood, made the ark. Drunk. To the extent he did not know whatever it was his younger son did to him. But when he awoke from his wine, when Lot awoke from his wine, he realized that he was both the father and the grandfather of two boys. Wine in scripture refers to several things. If you read the third angel's message in Revelation 14 from verse 9, and they followed another angel saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So wine representing God's wrath Without mercy. And by the way, that's coming. You know, Psalm 100 says, His mercy endureth forever. Well, I'm not sure what that interpretation means, but there comes a time when God shows no mercy. Now, that really has not happened yet. There was mercy for Sodom and Gomorrah, if conditions were right. God has always been merciful, but when he pours out the plagues, there will be no mercy. So wine represents God's unmixed wrath. Revelation 18, from verse 1, And I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Here, wine represents false doctrine called fornication. So wine represents wrath, wine represents False doctrine. Wine also represents true doctrine which Jesus brought. You can't put new wine in old bottles. So we have to understand the context Know what wine means. In the case of Noah, wine did not mean true doctrine. In the case of Lot, it did not mean true doctrine. It meant something that seduces the senses and puts to sleep the power of reasoning. I want you to follow me closely. Two minutes after eight. You said your eyes have been open since you've been here. Perhaps some of your misconceptions have been exposed. The assumptions by which we function that lead us to misunderstand God and exercise very little faith in him. Are you beginning to awaken from your wine? that has kept you from evangelizing successfully wherever you are. Whatever that wine may be, it may be, well, there are just a few of us. In the secular setting, numbers mean power, not with God, because God has never had numbers on his side. Jesus, from his own lips, the road to perdition, how many go that road? Many. The road to salvation, how many go? Few. The difference between few and many is huge. How many went into the ark? Eight. How many came out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, effectively, three. <laughs> because the pill of salt does not count. <laughs> so it's not numbers. So that may be one misconception that has intoxicated you. There are not enough of us. And there are 40,000 students on this campus. Can't do it. Or... I pay thousands of dollars per, per what, whatever, uh, credit hour. And the Lord wants me to use my money wisely. So I need to put all my time into my studies wrong. 
that's wine seducing you. Or I have a responsibility to study, get my degree, then go use it and witness. Wrong. You have no guarantee you'll be alive tomorrow. Wine. Alcohol. Confusing your reasoning powers. Or you may say, I don't know enough scripture to witness. Wrong. The devil will see to it that you never know enough. There is no living person dead, alive, or will ever be born other than Jesus who knows everything. And even Jesus in his human condition did not know everything. As Eloi says, he learned as he grew. In his human condition, he did not know everything. The devil intoxicates us with a variety of streams of wines. Different vintages, but the outcome is the same. Our thinking is confused. Our reasoning is warped. And the conclusions to which we come are all wrong. With respect to how effective we can be on our individual campuses. And it is time for us, by a careful examination of the Word of God, by listening very carefully, as I believe you have, to the presentations that have been made. You heard Elder Torres yesterday. You listen to his presentations. And then you realize what it is God requires of you to be an effective tool in his hand. My brothers, my sisters, you and I need to awaken from our wine that we may see what the world has been doing to us. As Noah awoke from his wine, the world is trying to corrupt your thinking. The world is trying to influence your tastes. The world wants to control the way you, you, you evaluate what's necessary, what's vital, what's important in my life, and what is not. And so the world will have you believe that certain things are necessary for you to feel important. So if you drive this car, you feel important. If you lose 10 pounds, then you feel good about yourself, whether you're a sinner or not. And Jesus desires to enlighten us with his word to bring us out of the intoxication so that we may see what the world has been doing to us even though we think we were safely placed in various sanctuaries, whether in Boston or Georgia. Or... I'll ask you a question. Don't answer me. Is it possible that you have been slightly intoxicated based on what you have heard so far? By that I mean the way you've been thinking, the way you've been limiting God by your, pre your presuppositions. And as Brother Justin said, the first, uh, first devotion he gave, by our fears. We are drunk with lack of faith. And God wants us to awaken in the prodigal son in Luke 15, reading from verse 11, the Bible says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. What does verse 17 say? And when he came to himself, stop. Someone here has to come to himself or herself. And I don't know who it is. If I knew who you were, I'd come to you at lunch or dinner or in the stairwell and say, look, I need to talk to you. I'd come to you by night like Nicodemus coming to Jesus. Somebody needs to come to himself or herself. Because we've, we perhaps have chosen a direction that looked glamorous. But it's a waste of substance. My substance attack doesn't mean particularly money. It means the resources God has given you to serve him. We prostitute them 
in the service of the enemy while going to church every Sabbath. Don't wait until your circumstances are so dire that that's the only time you can come to yourself. That happens to many alcoholics, addicts. As we say, they have to hit what? That's not necessary. You know, it's not necessary. You know, people say experience is the best teacher. That's not true. In the sense that you don't have to experience it. Now, somebody else's experience is the best teacher, but not yours. So don't smoke drop to know what it's like. Don't kill to know what it's like. You don't have to experience it. Jesus never experienced sin. He never sinned. Never had that experience, but he could sympathize with us. And so I am saying to you, is there someone here who has gone off to a far country but not actually leaving physically? How do we do that? We go here. Mental traveler. Come to yourself. Realize that you are alive for one reason. When am I supposed to finish? I promise not to say that anymore, but uh, when I'm done, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pippin. <laughs> you are alive for one reason. Let me explain it this way. In Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I form thee, in the belly, what? I knew thee. Now, listen to the verse carefully. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, what? I sanctify thee and ordain thee a prophet to the nations. Now, what is God saying? Long before Jeremiah's father met his mother, did God know Jeremiah? Yes. Did he have a job description for Jeremiah? Yes. You see, God functions, he begins with a purpose. Then he says, now, this is what I want done. That's the purpose. Now, how can I operationalize this? I'll give life to a person called Jeremiah. And let him operationalize this purpose. So that he is alive for one reason only. To do that. Are you following me? Yeah. To do that. Jesus, before he was born. He was the lamb slain from when? What was his mission? Savior. That's why he, he came as a human being. Remember last night, was it last night, when the man said, speak to my brother, and he divided in Jesus said, who made me? Mm -hmm. I came to save. So the Lord handpicked Jeremiah before he was born. God had a purpose. I need someone to reach out to Jerusalem and warn Jerusalem about its course, political course, and spiritual. Now, and this is my purpose. They need to know now who can carry it out. Jeremiah. So God sees a man, says, this is a nice fellow. He sees a woman, he says, come. And they become Mr. and Mrs. Jeremiah's parents. <laughs> then here comes Jeremiah. One purpose. Now, listen carefully to this. If Jeremiah had chosen another line of work, he would have been living fraudulently. Why do I say that? If you give me $100 and tell me go buy groceries for you, and I come back with CDs by uh, Little Kim. <laughs> have I used your money honestly? No. I have used it? Fraudulently. So you know, Sister Kim. <laughs> now God told Jeremiah, you are here <laughs> to be a prophet to the nations. And that's what Jeremiah did. So Jeremiah fulfilled the purpose. You see, what I'm saying is existence is the vehicle for the carrying out of purpose. Was that too complicated? Did you get it? You fought from Harvard? <laughs> existence is the vehicle for the carrying out of purpose. Because God begins with a purpose first. If he didn't do that, then he would create things for no reason. Then he'd have to find a purpose. God doesn't work like that. Everything has a purpose ahead of time. Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That has not changed from then till now. 
then what is the reason for your existence on this earth? You can tell me, I'm listening. To reflect God's image. I was in the chapel, where is it? Fourth floor. Went in there to spend a few quiet moments. And I saw these statues in there. What is the purpose of an image? To represent just any image. What's the purpose of an image? To, rep to represent. That's the only purpose of an image. The only purpose of an image is to reflect accurately the original. So that when people come face to face with the original, based on what they have had with the, with the, the image, they are. Ah, yeah. I saw you. No, it wasn't me. It was an image. But just like me. You and I have no other reason for living. None. And when we live contrary to that purpose that God has for us, we are living fraudulently. And that's no way to live. Let's awaken from the wine of deception. The deception that says you can choose your line of work. No, you can't do that. God has chosen that for you. Now you need to ask him. Be in line with him. Connected to him that he may reveal to you at his speed what precisely he desires to have you do. But my brothers and sisters, we cannot allow the world to get us drunk. A lot of drunk Christians are trying to change the church into the world. Because they've been made drunk by the world. And they do everything in their power to make the church like the world. But we must be sober. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober. What else? Be vigilant. A drunk man can't be vigilant. And of course a drunk man is not sober. Be sober. Be vigilant. For your adversary the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about. That walking about is not accidental. He is on the prowl for your soul, mine, and that of your friends. So I ask you from my heart, if you have gone into a far country, just here, and that's the only place you need to go, come to yourself and come back. If you've been made drunk with the wine of secular thinking, ask God, please, Lord, let me awaken from my wine and see what the world has done to me. The world has made me hate hymns. Because I listen to as a, you know, the world has caused me to hate modest dress because all I see is. The world has caused me to hate, you know, conversations about Jesus. Because the world regards that as silly and stupid. Talk about Martha Stewart. The world has caused me to be embarrassed to be close to church. Because there's stadiums with 50,000 and 40,000 watching millionaires perspire and fall down and get up and fall down and get up. And so we're intoxicated by the world. The world has made Bible study. Ah, silly, old-fashioned, antiquated, something from the primordial era, the Jurassic era. Why? Well, there's People magazine. There's Jet. There's Ebony, and they're more colorful than this. Let's wake up. What's happening to me? Why can't I watch a basketball game for three and a half hours and hope it goes into overtime, but the preacher has to be finished in 20 minutes? What's wrong with me? I'm drunk. <laughs> Sit in a stadium for four hours. Ten degrees below zero. Don't you see it in the, in, in, in the summer, in, 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 in the winter, when football is on? New England Patriots or um, Green Bay Packers? People in mittens and... and, and, and Scarves and, uh, but the, the stadium is packed and it's cold and they're there. Invite them to church. Service is too long. How long is it? Half an hour. How long was the game? Four and a half hours. 
two hours before for uh, tailgate partying. You can't spend half an hour. No, listen to me. Some of us suffer from that. And we call ourselves spiritual. We have to wake up from our wine. And when we see what the world has done to us, we don't want to go back. Let's come to ourselves. The Bible says in John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is not 99% spirit, 100%. Flesh, 100%. And the flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5, 17, I think, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. You can't have a fleshly spiritual person. Although many of us try. And so I appeal to you as your brother in Christ. Let us open our eyes. Let's wake up from our wine. If we don't, one morning we will wake up. And it will be too late for sobriety. Please, as the Holy Spirit of God touches your heart, and I believe he is, determine before this weekend is over, before this night is over, before I get off this desk, this uh, thing, Lord, wake me up from my wine. Bring me to my senses. How many of you will say that? Raise your right hand quickly. Stand up. We're going to pray. I will let you pray first. Pray in your heart. If what I've said apply to you, apologize to God. Tell him you're sorry. Private. One minute, 60 seconds. And then ask him to give you a heart that desires spiritual things. Ask him to make you all spirit. All spirit. After 60 seconds, then I'll pray for all of us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Holy Father, the very first promise of the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Lord, fulfill that promise in our lives now and put enmity in our hearts, hatred for everything that is of the world that is of the devil. Let us love that which is spiritual, Father. Jesus loved it and hate. Jesus himself said, No man can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other. He was using extreme language, opposites one from the other. Hate the one, love the other. Or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. Father, help us to take that attitude. We hate the world and all that is in the world. We want to love everything that is of Christ. Because we are spiritual, so we say. So accept our, our apologies, dear God, our confession. Give us repentance that we may turn 180 degrees and give ourselves to you as instruments in your hands without reservation. With every day, Lord, open our eyes a little wider that we may see the horror of our past intoxication and recommit ourselves constantly never to go back to that life. Bless every man, woman, under the sound of my voice. Let us pass this night with an unsleeping consciousness that these hours are holy. We must guard our conversation, our thoughts, our behavior, because we are a spectacle to people at this place. Hear this humble prayer, God. We love you. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.